And that is why I have nine fingers. Oh, sorry, I forgot to rewind the tape. Just a moment. There we go. There are some stories that we unfortunately had to skip due to time management issues. For example, we still need to cover the Holding Abyss story and the High Noon Alternative Universe lore. We also missed out on Nar, whose story I actually already recorded, but the delivery from my side felt mediocre, so I'll keep him in the oven a bit longer. Anyway, today we will have a quick look at Syndra, and when I mean quick look, let's sum it all up in 10 minutes, which is enough for the YouTube gods to appreciate our effort. Syndra's story is composed of two parts, her bio and not so short short story. Again we are making a TLDR of this, so this is not the best way to experience the story. Her bio explains the basics. Here we learn that as a child Syndra was distracted by everything, even the tiniest beetle would break her focus, and she never finished her work. This led her parents into being angry at her quite often. At first they were mad because she couldn't stay focused, but eventually they started blaming her for every misfortune in their family. Her brother Evard was the biggest douchebag of their family. He made fun of her the most and to such a degree that Syndra often fled to the Ghost Willow, a sacred tree of their village. But one night Evard and his friends weren't satisfied with their bullying yet, so they followed her to the tree and made fun of her some more. Syndra ignored it all and kept praying to the tree. But when one of them threw a clump of dirt at her head, that was it. Syndra's anger erupted and formed dark magical orbs that drained life from the world around them. This led to the destruction of the tree, the villagers being angry at Syndra's family and the family looking for a new home. All because Evart was a douche. Eventually the family met a priest called Konigen, who taught people how to control magic on an island called Faelor. There Syndra spent years training with him, only to realize that instead of gaining more control, her magic was getting weaker. So she confronted her master and learned that he was actually trying to dampen her power for her own safety. Syndra didn't take that lightly and her anger erupted again. Long and behold, Konigen's dead. But Syndra's anger kept going and she destroyed the temple and drained raw magic from the island itself. Of course, Ionia's lands are alive and the spirit of Ionia didn't like that. So the bedrock opened beneath her and Syndra fell into living waters that suppressed her powers. Here Syndra dreamed for many years until the Noxian invasion arrived. And when it did, some people wanted to kill Syndra, but the guardians of the island woke her up in hopes that she would help them against the Noxians. Boy was that a mistake. She killed everyone no matter what faction they were, ripped the tower from the ground and flew away on it. A classic Disney story. All of that was in Syndra's bio, but we also got her short story called The Dreaming Pool. The story starts with Syndra dreaming of the night she destroyed the Ghost Willow. This tells us that the story takes place during the invasion, while Syndra was still imprisoned underground by Ionia itself. The story then quickly shifts up to the surface of Faelor, where we are introduced to a new character. Kaelan, a cat like Vastaya wearing Noxian armor. Since the Vastaya are native to Ionia, it doesn't take a second guess to know he's a traitor. But immediately after his introduction, we learned that he joined the armies of Noxus after the Battle of the Placidium, and he requested to be the governor of Faelor as a reward for his service, giving us a hint that he might not be entirely a traitor. In fact, the spirit of Ionia told Kaelan to keep watch over Syndra in these lands, and since these lands were now a Noxian territory, he really had no other choice. The story then shifts to nighttime, to two different Vastaya sneaking onto a Noxian warship where they silently cut down all of its wardens. It was Okin and Sirik, a brother and sister of Astaya. They carried the dark crystal with them which Sirik hid below the deck, while Okin signaled seven other dark figures to climb up onto the ship. They were the Disposed, the last group of Vastaya that occupied these lands before the Noxian invasion. Together these nine Vastaya then sneaked towards the fortress of Faelor. They were able to sneak deep into the fortress without being seen by anyone and with only a few dozen silent kills. Since it was their people who built this place, it wasn't a hard task. But soon enough, shouting echoed from the docks, followed by ringing bell. The Vastayan team realized the Noxians already knew something was happening, but that wouldn't change their plan. Sirik closed her eyes and transported her mind to the crystal she previously hid below the ship deck. Not only was she able to see through it, but she was also able to bring the crystal to life. She wasn't a conjurer or a soul mage. The Vastaya just have these random weird skills. For normal humans, it's like being able to whistle or to understand income tax. Either way, the crystal she brought to life was a firestone and it triggered a massive explosion in the docks, which is where the story transports us next. Kaelan was already there, inspecting what had happened. 
while other Noxians thought it was a black powder explosion, triggered as a cowardly act instead of taking them head on. Kaelin knew it was caused by a firestone, used as a distraction while the intruders headed towards the dreaming pool. The story then shifts back to the Vastayan group. They stood before the main tower of the fortress. Tolling bells were sounding the alarm all around them, so they didn't have to sneak anymore. They sprinted forward as they avoided arrows coming from above. A handful of guards blocked their path, but the Vastaya danced through them without slowing down. This is where the first member of the Vastayan group fell, while the rest pressed on. A massive staircase led their way to the shrine, but on their way up they lost two more members. One died with two arrows in his chest, the other pierced by a spear. Before the entrance there were two more elite guards, male and female. The strike team was able to take down the female guard, but another Vastaya died with shield crushing his throat. With a roar of grief, the other guard hacked down another Vastaya with his cleaver. Then the male guard ran to his fallen comrade, hugging her and ignoring the fact that he was in the middle of a battle. Sirik called for mercy and the team wanted to continue without killing the other guard. Of course the guard didn't understand Vastayan language, but he did recognize their intent. With grief-filled eyes, he picked up his blade and launched himself at Sirik. Perhaps the guard knew what would happen, but such was the end of the other guard. This scene was one of the saddest Noxian deaths in any story. The four remaining Vastaya continued inside the shrine to the Dreaming Pool. Here we learned that Sirik and the others were previously tasked with protecting the person locked within the shrine, to ensure she never gets released. All of them knew this mission was a one-way trip, none of them expected to come back from it. All that mattered was completing the task, to end the threat imprisoned down there within the Dreaming Pool once and for all. The story then returns back to Syndra's repeated dreaming. She was replaying the same dream in her head we have seen at the beginning of the story, the one about destroying the Ghost Willow. Only now, the dream was interrupted right before she burst with anger. Four dark shapes entered the dream, and Syndra felt something was wrong. This wasn't how it was meant to be. Outside the dream, the four Vastaya stood in circle above the waters imprisoning Syndra. All of them removed their hoods to show their face tattoos, marking them as guardians of Phalor. The reason why the guardians kept Syndra alive for all these years was because she was protected by Ionia. They couldn't answer why nature was sustaining her, and so they let her be. But now Syndra was in Noxian territory, making her much more dangerous. Sirik walked into the pool with her blade drawn, getting ready to complete the task. But her brother Okin interrupted her. He thought that maybe Syndra would help them, or if she didn't, all they had to do was to release her. She would destroy the Noxian army for them. Siri couldn't believe what she was hearing from her brother, and she dismissed his foolish idea. That's when she realized it was her who was being circled by others with their blades drawn. Because plot twist? Her brother Okin and the others wanted to release Syndra all along, and if need be, they would kill Sirik in order to do so. There was a moment of silence when nobody was ready to escalate what was surely about to happen. Enough time for Kaelin, the Noxian Vastaya, to leap from the shadows onto the group. Sirik shouted in warning, but the others took it as a threat. They thought she was about to attack, and one of them flung two throwing daggers at her, one of which dug into Sirik's shoulder, and she fell into the waters awkwardly. Before anyone had a chance to react to the new threat, one Vastaya was already dead, pierced with a blade from behind, and Kaelin was already on his way towards Okin. All of them suddenly recognized the infamous Vastayan betrayer. Okin shouted insults at him and Kaelin laughed it off, revealing that maybe he really doesn't care about Ionia. After all, it was already littered with hundreds of mortal cultures, each with their own beliefs, while his own people never stood together. He made it feel like he values the fact that Noxus stands together. A fight erupted. Sirik pulled the throwing dagger from her shoulder and hit Kaelin in the neck. But even though he was injured, he was still too fast and too powerful to slam the skull of their last remaining companion into the wall. He then turned back to Okin. At this point, Sirik was too far away to help, so instead she turned back and started walking deeper into the water, towards Syndra. She planned on dying here anyway, at least she will complete their mission. She heard her brother shouting behind her, and Kaelin roaring, but she dared not to look back. She grabbed Syndra's throat, and she drew back her blade for a killing blow. The story then shifts back to Syndra's dreaming. Inside her dream, she could hear muffled shouts and roars coming from a nearby forest, as if they were really far away or underwater. For a moment, Syndra felt like she was drowning, even though she was in the middle of a forest. Then a hazy shadow appeared in front of her. Suddenly, she felt it grabbing around her throat, and she struggled to breathe. Her eyes flickered and she glimpsed a young woman, her face covered in twisting tattoos. A hand gripped her neck, and a blade was raised, ready to plunge down into... Then she was back in the forest. It was some kind of an awful waking dream. She was just on her way to the ghost willow to calm her rage. 
but she has already done that hundreds of thousands of times. What if this was the dream, she thought? What if the vision was real? Syndra's rage emerged just like in the dreams before, but this time she woke from her endless sleep. Syndra came to life in the real world. She floated above the water and hovered Cyric in the air next to her. The living shadows formed a crown on top of Syndra's head, with three orbs orbiting around her. Syndra learned that she was imprisoned here for decades. She answered to this information by hurling Cyric across the room, smashing her into a wall. It was painful, but Cyric was alive. Okin approached Syndra with friendly words. He told her about the Noxians and their tyranny. Of course, Syndra had no idea who these Noxians even are. She had never heard about them before. But she liked the idea of them killing people. After all, the only tyranny Syndra ever faced came from her own family. Her anger manifested once more, and she threw her orbs through Okin, draining his body of color. Kaelin tried to attack next, but he was thrown back by her orbs too. What's worse, Syndra recognized him as her jailer. Mockingly, Kaelin shouted at Syndra to kill him, and that she will never find peace. Everyone will hate her and hunt her. But instead of killing him, Syndra threw him into the pool, where instead of Syndra, the roots imprisoned Kaelin. Using her dark powers, she then ripped the rocks above her open, until she could see the stars. Rocks tumbled down and eventually they entombed Kaelin completely, who stayed motionless in the pool. Syndra then smoothly flew up out of the shrine. Moments later, Cyric managed to crawl up and she witnessed what Syndra has done. There was a massive earthquake and half of the fortress was missing. It was floating in the air, drifting north. The last part of the story shifts into the dream of Kaelin. In the dream he met a seer, a purple-skinned creature with a single horn growing from her forehead. Let's not walk around it, it is Soraka's premiere appearance in the updated lore. Soraka offered Kaelin two paths, both of which would lead to tragedy. In the first path, Kaelin would fight the invaders at the Placidium of Navori, Ionians would win, and he and his lover would live in peace for many years, but his children would die before him. In the second path, Kaelin would fight with the invaders. He will never see his lover again. He will be hated by everyone, friend or foe. After he would be defeated at Placidium, he would go to the Isle of Faelor and guard over the place of dreaming. In this path, his children would survive. Of course, we already know what choice he made, because all of this already happened. The only thing we don't know is how or where did he meet Soraka? And what relations does she have to the Vastaya? Is it possible that Soraka would be the spirit of Ionia? One thing is certain though, this means Soraka will get a proper story rework. Because right now, with her retconned interactions with Warwick, it's just a massive pile of plot holes. But hey, at this point I bet my finger Soraka couldn't get any worse. You always fight so poorly. And that is why I have nine fingers. <laughs> Hey, did you know that we have social media and Twitch where we talk about other league facts and stories? And did you know that we have need mugs and shirts too? The links to all of that will be below. And as always, thank you, come again.